appreciate the invitation. I'm going to tell you something. I've heard about my reputation for giving your pastor a hard time, and I thought, my goodness, I'm going to have to do better in that area. So I so I wrote this out. I want to make sure I get it right. <laughs> Y'all have the most wonderful best, most spiritual, holy, greatest pastor's wife I have ever met. And so I think my wife might have got in and messed with my notes a little there. But uh, <laughs> so that's why you aren't seeing deer. You never told me you're doing jumping, Jackson. The only reason I bring him down is if I set him in this part of the woods and I'm over in this part of the woods, all the deer come over to this part of the woods, and uh, we have a good time. Man, I enjoyed the music. What a blessing. Now, now pinch yourself every once in a while. So easy to be in a place where you're so blessed and just get used to it and it becomes normal. And I was up here, man, I just about went Pentecostal a couple of times. <laughs> that drum lady, she scared the dickens out of me once. <laughs> man, so started that thing and I just about came out of my and then Tinkerbell over there was doing her thing I kept looking around for fairy dust I don't know what was going on there but man it was all good it all came together it worked and uh, <laughs> I'm just I'm pathetic when it comes to music I am so bad at everything musical that I have a heightened appreciation. I say to those of you that are blessed in that area, I hope that you're enjoying the talent that was obviously withheld from me so that <laughs> God could give you extra. And so <laughs> I'm not bitter, I'm not. But uh, I, I enjoy good music and y'all do a great job, a great job with that. Well, I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> We're coming off a trip from the, been, me and my wife been to the Philippines and been over there. By the way, Bill Hardecker and Marsha and WT and my main man, Joey, said to say hi to grandma and grandpa. And they are so much fun. Uh, we had a good time, was with them for a few days, then flew to the southern part and put on a teen revival down there, preached a teen camp, over a thousand teenagers showed up at this one camp. Brother, you talk about convicting. 17 different churches, and these churches come in, and some of them from 20 hours away, traveling by boat uh, and by walking, uh, jeepneys, any way they can get there. And uh, they bring all of their own tents. They bring all of their own food. They bring adults that will cook the food, and they just set up camps. I mean, church camp is church camp. And, uh, and then they show up hungry for the Word of God. Amen. And I'll be honest with you, it's hard to preach to them. You don't feel worthy to stand up and preach to these people. And it was such an honor. I mean that, such an honor. And uh, those pastors love their people. And to see over 200 of that thousand get saved. And then each of those pastors deal individually with their converts. And then the last night, the camp was right on the ocean and to watch those pastors go out with those new converts and a group here and a group here and watch them baptize those converts. Brother, it was on, man. It was on. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I just got back. In fact, we landed our last leg of the trip this morning. I landed in Indianapolis at three o'clock this morning. No, two, uh, one o'clock. See, I'm already messed One o'clock this morning. Laid my head on my pillow at three o'clock. I am so jet lagged. I'm so glad to be in your pulpit and not mine. <laughs> but I've got an excuse. I can say almost anything and get by with it because of the condition that I'm in. So I have no idea if any of this is gonna make sense. And uh, <laughs> don't say it, don't say it. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> He's like, how is that different from any other time you've been here? Second Samuel chapter number 12. And I, I do love the theme and I love the word of God. And folks, uh, thank you, Brother Brown. Good night. 
I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. And uh, we all need to be reminded of what we take for granted, that we just pick up this book as if it's always been here, and we don't know how blessed we are. Second Samuel, I'm going to take you to the very end of the chapter, and I want to tell you a story, talk about this story, and, and preach on the on the, the person of Joab. And I'll, and I'll lay the groundwork a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about Joab, fascinating man, man of great contradictions. But uh, we'll begin in verse 26, 2 Samuel 12, 26. And Joab fought against Rabbah of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. Now notice the wording here, folks. I believe all scriptures given by inspiration of God is just profitable. God has uh, taken good care of it. We don't need to correct it. We need to let it correct us. Amen. So we don't need to try to explain away what's plain in front of us. It says Ammon fought, so he fought against it. And the Bible says that he took the royal city. And he reaffirms that in verse 27 in the message he sends to David. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Robin and have taken the city of water. Sounds like a done deal to me. Sounds like the battle's over. Everything's finished. The only thing that hasn't taken place is a formal surrender. And we read in verse 28, Now therefore, or this is good for us, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it. Well, wait a minute. I thought he took it. He did. He sends a message to David and says, I want you to come and I want you to stage, basically stage a ceremonial battle. I want you to come so that you're the one that leads the final troops in through the door. Why did he want that to happen? Boy, notice the end of verse 28. Let me read the whole thing. Now, therefore, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. So what happens? Verse 29, and David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. Verse 30, and he took their king's crown from off his head. The, weight, the whereof was a talent of gold with precious stones, and it was set on, David's, set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. Heavenly Father, we're going to learn one great main truth, maybe several applications, but one main truth. And I hope God will put deep in our hearts. Lord, whether we've been in the ministry for six months, or 60 years, or whether we're a, we, we maybe are a young man or a young lady preparing for ministry, there's something we better get. This isn't just a preacher or an evangelist or a missionary or full-time worker's message. This is a caution to all of us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we will be helped by this, and it'll help keep us, dear God, in the place of great blessing in our ministries. We, we pray this, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Study of the life of Joab reveals a complex and conflicted Bible character. He was a man of, of great highs and greater lows. His life contains acts of courage and bravery, but sadly these acts are tarnished by acts of treason and treachery. Joab was the prototype Israeli warrior. On the battlefield, he was fierce and fearless, ferocious in his defense of his nation and in the carrying out of the orders of his king. He received the title of the captain of the hosts of David's army. He, he received it the old-fashioned way. He earned it. We read in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, David issues a challenge, and David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, and the inhabitants of the land, and the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. And David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. I love this verse. So Joab, the son of Zariah, went first up and was chief. I don't know if you have ever studied enough of ancient battle history to know what it is to assault a walled, walled city, but the first man to the top isn't usually the one 
that lives to tell about it. This man was a courageous man, and he met the challenge issued by his king and won the title of captain of the host of Israel. And there's so many things about Joab I love. I, I won't, of course, tell all of these stories, but there's so many positives in his life. Joab was one of the original David's mighty men who sought out David in the wilderness and protected him against King Saul during those years. Joab was called upon in 1 Chronicles chapter 19 when the Amorites hired the Syrian armies and their combined forces came against Israel. I love this. The Bible says this, and when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And man, when an invading army came to assault the nation, you know what David did? He just turned around to Joab and said, hey, take them in and take care of this. And if you read the, the uh, chapter, uh, David, or Joab certainly did that. By the time he got done with them, the chapter concludes with this uh, statement, neither would the Syrians help the children of Amnon anymore. <laughs> they learned their lesson. Joab sent them home licking their wounds. I love Joab. It was Joab who tried to talk David out of numbering the people of Israel. Remember 1 Chronicles 21, that great sin that caused such devastation and judgment upon a nation? It was Joab who sought to heal the rift between King David and his son Absalom. It was Joab who came to rebuke the king uh, when David turned uh, uh, the, what should have been a celebration in Israel into a time of trepidation because of his broken heart over the death of Absalom. He loved his king, but he saw his king making a mistake and losing the loyalty of the people. He went and rebuked him. Probably my favorite, next to favorite Joab story is when Sheba, this is a Benjamite, Benjaminite, and he decides to rise up against David and try to uh, uh, stage a coup, civil war. And again, David just looks at Joab and says, go take care of it. And so when Sheba heard that Joab was coming. He decided he didn't want to be king after all. Took off running, went to a walled city, hid in the walled city. David, Joab shows up with all his men, says open the gate. They wouldn't open the gate. So he said, boys, tear the wall down. And they're in the process of tearing the wall down. And a wise woman of the city cries out, hear, hear, say I pray you unto Joab. Come here thither that I may speak with thee. And when he was coming to her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. And she basically said, What are you doing? Why are you doing this to a mother of Israel? And Joab says, Listen, I don't want to tear your city up on your wall down. Just cut off Sheba's head and throw it over the wall. <laughs> if you do that, we'll go home. The woman said, I'll be right back. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, here comes the head. He picks it up. Yep, that's the guy. And uh, that's the end of that story. And as much as I can celebrate these amazing achievements in Joab's life, then you read these other stories, folks. On the battlefield, he was confident and in control. And yet when he got off the battlefield, it seemed like he, he was plagued by jealousy and petty revenge. He was a man who defeated armies, but could not seem to defeat his own insecurities. For all the positive stories, there are some terrible missteps and mistakes in the life of Joab. When Abner, Saul's captain of the host, sought to end Israel's civil war by coming over to David's side, Joab deemed his petty jealousy and personal revenge more important than the stability and unity of a nation and he takes the life of this man. It was Joab, Joab who was complicit in the assassination of Uriah to help hide David's sin with Bathsheba. It was also Joab when Absalom turned traitor who executed him by commanding his men to throw the darts into the body of Absalom as he hung by his hair in the tree. And he did this in direct disobedience to King David's orders. It was Joab's captain of the host when David decided to replace him with Amasa, who sent a message to Amasa, and then when Amasa returned, gave him a hug and took a, 
a dagger and run it into his fifth rib and cold-blooded murder killed his would-be replacement. Sadly, this one-time great captain, the host at the end of his life, was executed for the innocent blood he had shed, hacked to death while holding on to the horns of the altar in God's tabernacle. What a conflict. Such great mountaintops, such horribly deep valleys, such greatness, and yet such disappointment. But I want to set all that aside and just focus in on one story, and this is my favorite Joab story of all, and that's the story we find in 2 Samuel chapter number 12. Of all the stories, both good and bad, there's no, no story that captivates me like this story. And we see here that Joab is sent by David to defeat Rabbah of the children of Amnon. And the Bible says that he took the royal city. Now, I want you to understand what's happening here. We read the passage, but let's look again at verse 26. And Joab fought against Rabbah and of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and have taken the city of waters. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it lest I take the city and it be called after my name. What happened, preacher? Joab defeated the city of Rabbah. He did exactly what his king sent him to do. Joab Joab then refused to accept the surrender of Rabbah until he could send a messenger to get King David until King David was present. Now watch this. He did so. We know this because the scriptures are specific about it. He did so because he was afraid that the city would be called after his name. For all of Joab's flaws, there's one quality that all of us can learn from and that all of us should mimic Please listen to the message tonight. Joab understood that there was just one king and that the crown should be given to the king. Can I, can I remind everyone in here tonight of one great truth? We have a king and his name is Jesus Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Psalms 47, oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph, for the Lord most high is terrible. He's a great king over all the earth. 1 Timothy 1, 17, now unto the king, capital K, king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 6, 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentent, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who hath or who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Revelations 19, And I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, on his heads were many crowned, he had a name written which no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture, vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule over them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture... And on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Preacher, what can we learn from this story, this little story tucked at the end of a chapter in 2 Samuel? What can we learn from it? First of all, folks, write this down. Put it in your heart somewhere. There are many warriors, but there is just one king. There are many warriors, but there is just one king. Do you know it's an honor to be a soldier of the Lord? I have an opportunity to serve my king. I'm a warrior. I serve King Jesus. I'm a soldier of the king. I'm here to serve my king. Fight to advance his cause. Fight, fight to bring honor to his name. That's what a soldier of the cross does. The Bible says, Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. It goes on to say this. It says, uh, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You've been chosen to be a soldier of the king. It's a privilege to be a soldier of the king. I mean, relish in the idea that you get to serve in the Lord's army. But remember this. You can be a warrior, and we need soldiers, but there's only one king, and only one person deserves the crown. 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory for and ever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a Good warfare. I want a war of good warfare. I want to battle for the Lord. I want to fight for the Lord. And with His help and strength, I want to win some victories for the Lord. But I'm not interested in the crown. And I'm not interested in becoming a king. I'm real happy just being a soldier. Because there's only one king. And that's King Jesus. Jude 1, 3, Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Yes, let's stand for the faith. Yes, let's fight for the faith. Yes, let's stand for the Word of God. And let's win battles for the Lord. But you know what? When it comes time for somebody to put a crown on somebody's head, let's just make sure it goes on the head of the only one who has on his breast plate and on his side, the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 1 Corinthians 9, and every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I, so fight I, I like that, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Folks, I've been doing this for a while, and you know what? I get up every morning with the intent of going to battle. I don't do it haphazardly. I don't spend a lot of time anymore swinging and just hitting the air. I'm very purposeful in my attack. I'm very purposeful in, in, in uh, who the enemy is and how to take the battle to him. I'm very purposeful in the way I live my life. But I want to remind you and me tonight, we're just soldiers. We're just soldiers. Say, preacher, I've never heard of you till tonight. Who's Jerry Ross? He's just a sinner saved by grace. He's just a bunch of dirt that God collected and breathed in the nostrils, the breath of life. He's just been given a little time here to live on this earth, to serve his generation by the will of God. But let me tell you this. God was just fine before Jerry Ross got here, and he'll be just fine after I'm gone. We're just here for a while, and we're here to fight, and, and with God's help, win some battles. But all we are is souls. We don't need an, a, a king number two or a king number three or a king number four. We don't need seven or eight people wrestling around in the aisle of a church uh, trying to fight over who gets to wear the crown that week. You know what? If we just remember that we're soldiers and it's an honor to be a soldier. I know Joab was a mess and I know I could spend hours nitpicking about his life. And, and to be honest with you, I cringe at some of the things that he did. But if he had one thing right, he understood this. I'll fight the battle. And I'll give my life if necessary. But if we win, nobody walks through that gate. Nobody accepts the surrender. Nobody gets the glory. Nobody takes the crown. 
We call our king and we bring him and we put the crown on the head of our, of our king. I'm a warrior. It's what I signed up for as a young man. I'm a soldier of the cross. I'm here to serve my king. I'm here to fight to advance his cause, fight to bring honor to his name, glory to his name. What are you, preacher? I'm just a foot soldier. I'm just a front line grunt. That's what I am. I'm just wake up every morning, and put on the armor of the Lord. Every day I choose to wear the armor of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And I shod my feet with the gospel of peace and strapped to my arm the shield of faith and place on my head the helmet of salvation. I wrap my hand around the hilt of the sword of the spirit. I step into this world ready to do battle. My love is not for this world. My love is for my king. My master is not my flesh. My master is my king. I do not live to do my pleasure. I live to accomplish his will. I wear his armor. I master the use of his sword. Why? Why? Because me and him have the same enemy. I do so because I have a sworn enemy, and that enemy is the devil. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... I serve under his banner, the banner of the cross. I wear his armor. I do so because his enemy has now become my enemy. And I want to say this. We have a sworn enemy. And you know what? I'll say it publicly. And I need to say it just so I hear it every once in a while. So bear witness, witness with me. But me and the devil, we're not on the same side. We have nothing in common. Everything I love, he hates. Everything he hates, I love. Everything that's precious to me, he's, he wants to destroy. And you know what I want to do? I want to spend my life sneaking into his backyard and stealing his kids from him. So he don't like me, but hey, I don't like him either. We're not on the same side. Hey, some of you young men, decide which side you're on. Stop playing footsie with the devil. Good night. If we were keeping score this week, young man, have you scored more points for Team Jesus or Team Satan? Pick a side. Pick a side. I made my choice when I was a teenager and I decided I was going to go to war, but I wasn't going to spend my life warring against the Lord on the devil's side. I decided I'd go to the Lord's side and war against the devil. You say, why do you hate the devil? Because he's the sworn enemy of my king. He's the sworn enemy of my king. You take sides against my king, you've taken sides against me. I'm not confused about where my loyalties are. Some of you young men, young ladies, you're confused. It's all right. Got to go through that time. But I think it'd be a good night just to come to an old-fashioned altar and settle it once forever. Just decide, hey, Lord, I've just showed up. And you know what? Lord, if you'll let me use this. By the way, he's given you a sword. Here you go. It's what the whole conference is about. Why don't you take that sword and start mastering it? You're going to need it. Perfect your skills with the sword. It's going to mean life or death one of these days. Pick up that shield of faith. Strap it on your arm. Make sure you have that helmet of salvation. Stand for truth. Stand for righteousness. Put your soul winning shoes back on. Decide whose side you're on. Be a soldier. It's an honor to be a soldier. I want you to embrace that. I serve under his banner. I wear his armor. We share a, a sworn enemy. I, I share his mission. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, if that's why the king came, then that's what I'm going to spend my life doing. Whatever his mission is, is my mission. He commanded us to occupy till I come. 
The word occupy is a military term. During World War II, there were occupied territories, unoccupied territories. Come on, military men. Some geographical areas had been conquered and others had not yet been conquered. Folks, there are parts of this kingdom called the earth that have not yet been conquered for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need young soldiers that will go out there and spearhead some efforts and take some land and take some people and take some hearts and win some families that the devil's wreaking havoc with. But you're not going to do it as long as you keep playing footsie with the enemy. He's not your friend. Everything he's offering you and tempting you, you with and tantalizing you with, young lady, is the same thing that he'll destroy your life with. And when you're destroyed, he'll stand over the top of you and laugh in your face for being a fool. Man alive, every single Christian young man and young lady at some point need to make their way to the altar and just say, Lord, I enlist. I'm a child of God, but I've never signed up for the army. I'm signing up tonight. It's an honor to serve the Lord. My goodness sakes, I made that trip to the altar when I was just shy of 17 years of age. I'm 57 now. That's been 40 years ago. Say, what have you done, preacher? I just got up the best I can. By the way, I, I'm like Joab. I haven't got it all right. And by the way, neither of you, ma'am, neither of you, sir. But you know what? I've gotten up every day and just strapped the armor on and held onto that sword. And I just go hacking every day, trying to just battle back the enemies of God and shine the light of the glorious gospel and, and take the gospel. Listen, folks, we need soldiers. We need soldiers. We need soldiers. So this is college days, is that right? You have college days. Brother, you know what this is? Hey, what is this place? Tell me what it is. Boot camp, that's what it is. It's a training ground for warriors. Okay, now if you want to be one of, you know, the devil's tinkerbells, then... Poor lady. I'm going to be buying some gifts later and leaving them... <laughs> Leaving them over here on the instrument. Okay, then go to Tinkerbell boot, boot Camp. I don't know. Go get training wherever the fairies go. <laughs> but fairies don't win battles. Okay, pretty boys aren't making a difference. I mean, you can't stink and stand up to temptation in a Christian school or an independent fundamental Baptist church, and you're going to go out and do what? What I'm saying is, folks, it's a good thing to be a soldier. By the way, every one of these men that have been in it for 25 plus years, you, you go over and shake their hand. I promise you this, you can't see it with your eyes, but if you've been in that to it that long, it's, it's a war and it's a battle. And you know what? Every one of us carries scars. Men and ladies. But you know what? We're still standing. And every day we show up to duty. I'm here again, Lord, whatever you need. I'm a faithful soldier. I'm a faithful soldier. I want to tell you this. It's a good thing to be a soldier. King Jesus still needs soldiers. He needs those that will prepare and train. By the way, burn up. Burn it up. Tear it up. Destroy the dreams of your life. Lay them on an altar. Let God rewrite your life story tonight. He needs those that will prepare, train, become expert with the sword, have the courage to advance his cause into unreached areas of the, our country and our world. Jesus doesn't. He needs warriors, folks, but Jesus doesn't need any kings. If all you're coming forward to do is to build your own kingdom, then you've missed the whole point. He doesn't need you to build your kingdom. He needs you to advance his kingdom. He's not looking for a bunch of minor kings or vice kings. He needs frontline troops. My first point, we have a king and his name is Jesus. Number two, what else should we learn from Joab? We should fear the idea of stealing glory from our king. We should fear the idea. I love what it says here. Now, therefore, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against it and take it. Lest I take the city and it be called after my day. You know what we need? We need Christians to get that. I promise you, I promise you, preacher, 
If your church congregation got that, 95% of the church problems would disappear overnight. Because only by pride cometh contention. And we may not say it out loud, but the honest truth is most of us like to get a crown. We're fighting to get a crown. We want somebody to hand us a crown. We're mad if we think somebody else got the crown. Jesus isn't looking for kings. He's looking for warriors. It ought to terrify us. The idea of stealing glory from our king. Joe had, de had defeated Rabbah. The Bible says he had taken the city of waters. All that was left was the surrender ceremony. He could, he could have closed the deal. He could have accepted the crown. He could have been in the history books. He could have had a city named for him. Joab could even have rationalized that all of this was good and right because after all, he had gone to battle, not David. He had fought to take the city, not David. He defeated the enemy, not David. But for all of Joab's faults, the greatest attribute he possessed was one of loyalty to his king. He understood this. There is a king and I'm not him. If, by the way, if it wasn't for David, Joab wouldn't have had this army. If it wasn't for David, he's, he, you know what? Joab wouldn't have the weapons that they carried. If it wasn't for his king, then there would not have been the daily provisions and the daily supplies to sustain the siege. You know what? He reminded himself, I'm not here representing myself. I'm representing the king. I'm not here fighting for recognition. I'm here fighting for the king. I'm a warrior. He is the king. And it would be wrong for this city to be called by the name of a soldier. It would be wrong for it to be credited. I would, for me to be credited, credited with this victory. It'd be wrong for me to receive any glory. I was not sent here to build a name for myself. I was sent here in the name of my king. My country preacher daddy used to tell me, and I mean, he said it to me a hundred times. Son, the most dangerous place to stand in this world is between God and his glory. Is between God and his glory. One of the advantages of being in the ministry a long time is that you learn that God is consistent in his treatment of his servants. God is no respecter of persons. If you stay humble... He'll exalt you in due time. If you get the big head, he'll humble you. I mean, wasn't it Samuel that was sent by God that came to Saul and said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. I mean, come on. How many stories do you want me to tell? How many men can stand up and tell these same type of stories? How many men start out in the ministry of a humble heart and I mean, you know what? They got on their knees and they said, God, I can't do it without you. God, I can't do it without you. I got to preach. I did. I don't even know what I'm doing. God, please, please, please. God reached down and touched and anointed and the miraculous began to happen. And for a while it was give God the glory. If it, it would give God the glory, give God the glory, give God the glory. And then the guy gets online, creates a blog. And next thing you know, he's writing all of these articles of all of the secrets that he possesses to all of his successes. And God looks down and says, son, I was just fine before y'all came along. I'll just be fine after you. And by the way, I don't have to use you. I can reach over and pick up any of these knucklehead guys and bring them to higher heights than where I've gotten you. You are only there because I exalted you and I did it because you were humble. Remember the days, come on preacher. Remember the days when we wanted him to have the crown? Remember the days when we were embarrassed if our name got mentioned? Remember the days when we were more excited about hearing what a God instead of what a sermon or what a preacher? For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty. Boy, this is good for Jerry Ross to hear this. Folks, listen. We all fight with this whole same stuff. We're all made of flesh. Don't ask, act like you don't fight this stuff. 
Every once in a while, we all just need to hear to reach that button. Hey, you know what? Are you trying to ascend the throne? Come on. Are you, are you, are, I'm, I'm trying to help some of you. Are you trying to ascend the throne? You trying to build a kingdom? You spent more time and more money getting your name out in the last two years than you have promoting the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, what was wrong with just being a soldier? I mean, you got to carry a sword. You got to fight battles. You got to see victories. Let me tell you, the most successful men I know are the ones that's leading the charge. Come on, Joab. When you heard King David say, you see that? They're taunting us. They said, you can't come up hither. The Jebusites are taunting us. Let me tell you something. Any of you young men, first one at the top of that wall, you're the captain of the host. No traps looking at his buddies and he's like, son, you can try, but you ain't beating me. I don't know if he waited for a ladder. He may have just clawed his way through the mortar. He had a sword in his teeth and he was looking up there and he was looking death in the eye. But you know what? He was doing it because his king had said, go get up. He didn't know if he was going to live or die, but he knew this. By God's grace, you know what? By the end of the day, there was going to be victory for the king. For the king. Remember those days? Sweet days. 1 Corinthians 10, 30, For if I by grace be a partaker, then why am I evil spoken of for that? which I also give thanks, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Why has God not chosen the, the noble and the fool and the wise of this world? That no flesh should glory in his presence. I'm fearful sometimes about what our cause has become. Could it be that the majority of Bible preachers today are more interested in advancing their own names than lifting up the name of Jesus Christ? Are we more concerned with who knows us than we are with who knows the Lord? Do we spend more time talking about our ministry or the king of the universe? Let me just hit you point blank. Are you pouting out there tonight in this great gathering of Bible preachers and teachers because you feel that you've not been given in this meeting the attention and acclamation that in your heart you've become convinced you deserve. Never want what you deserve, sir. Ma'am, never want what you deserve. Because if this old boy got what I deserve right now, I'd be in hell screaming for one drop of water to be put on my tongue. Can I ask this question? Where are the John the Baptists of today? This is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? Better think about that. Here's the question. You talk about a loaded question. Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I'm not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, no. Listen to this. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. Period. Then this question, What sayest thou of thyself? What sayest thou of thyself? That question right now is probably going to hinge on the rest of your ministry, what God can or can't do with you. What sayest thou of thyself? Well, what John say? I mean, they said, give us your name. We got to go tell them, who are you? He said, I'm just the voice. One crying in the wilderness. <laughs> Make straight the way of the Lord. I mean, man, at that point, many of us would have been reaching in our pocket, getting our glossy presentation of ourselves, our family, our ministry. By the way, here's my anniversaries and birthdays so you can buy me gifts. <laughs> no, John said, I'm just a voice. Just a voice, that's all I am. They asked him, why baptizest thou, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered and saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom you know not. He it is who cometh after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it. I am not worthy to unloose. 
Next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he is before me. Then he said this, He must increase. Are you getting this tonight? Say, preacher, I know this, but we still need this reset button hit. He must increase. I must decrease. Do you have a plan laid out, sir? For the next 20 years of your ministry with specific steps on how Jesus is going to increase and how you are going to decrease? Show me that ministry philosophy, that ministry plan. Show it to me. When it comes to praise, we look, when it comes to the thing of praise, receiving praise, we ought to learn to play the childhood game of hot potato. <laughs> We should make practice of deflecting praise to those more deserving than ourselves. I, I had a kindergarten student that was so excited a couple years ago. She came to me and she had her first reader and she was bouncing, literally bouncing. Preacher, preacher. I said, what? She said, sit down. I can read. I want you to hear me read. So I sat down on the pew and she very meticulously sounded out each word phonetically. And it was exasperating and it took some time but she got them all done and when she got all done she looked at me and I said that is amazing I said let me quest ask you a question who taught you to read and her eyes shifted and shifted and shifted and she said nobody I've just always known <laughs> It was her moment of glory, and no one was going to steal it from her. <laughs> are you succeeding at something today? By the way, I hope you are. Success isn't a bad thing. Are you succeeding at something today? Is God's blessing starting to come upon your ministry or your endeavors? Are you becoming more recognized than you were in the past? When somebody compliments you, or notices those things. Be sure and give credit to where credit is due. Amen. Say, where is it due? First and foremost. Just point a finger upward. Say, preacher, what's going on at Blessed Oak Baptist Church? Man, I'll tell you what I would have told you 30 years ago. I'd have said, buddy, we are, the train is rolling down the tracks and I'm at the, I'm the engine ear in, in the engine. The first, I'm a, you know what, You'd ask, if you ask me, how's Blessed Hope doing? I said, I'd say after 40 years of ministry almost, I'm just, I'm just on the caboose hanging on trying not to fall off. If God is blessing any of us, come on. It is more despite us than because of us. Now just let that settle in right there. And this isn't false humility. This is fact. The fact that Lord blesses anything that Jerry Ross does just wonders in my eyes and it keeps me on my face and with a thankful heart. So if credit begins to come your way or God begins to bless, that's a good thing. Don't turn the faucet off. Give credit to where it's due. Gentlemen, where is it due? First of all, the Lord. Number two, to your wife. Say amen right there. Come on! The only reason some of us are even still pastors of our church is because if they got rid of us, they'd have to get rid of Mrs. and they like her. I don't know if there's a line at the judgment. I always hear about this line at the judgment seat. Who's going to be in the front? Who's going to be in the back? And I think a lot of us preachers are going to be shown our place in the line and it's going to be way in the back and we're going to be standing there going, what, what in the world is going on? And we'll look up towards the front and right near the front is going to be all our wives going. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Brother, I couldn't do what I'd do if it wasn't for my wife. You dust for fingerprints anything that I've ever done that's God's blessed, and you'll find my wife's fingerprints on it somewhere. I mean that. I'm not exaggerating. She wrote most of the message tonight. <laughs> it's one of my better ones. <laughs> you know, boy, that was great today. That was because of the Lord. That was great today. Listen, I couldn't get anything done for one for my wife. God's blessed me so much. 
By the way, why don't you deflect the, the praise over to your mom and dad? Amen. We owe our parents a debt. You know, somebody will sometimes say something about me and I'll say, well, that's not my natural inclination. But let me tell you about a, na- a man by the name of Robert Ross <laughs> that decided that he would see to it was my natural inclination. By the way, I'm glad I wasn't raised by a wimp. I'm glad my dad ruled the roost. I didn't know what it was, young men, to hear him say the same thing three, four, five times. I heard it once and then I woke up if I didn't hear it the second time. <laughs> I mean it. I thank God. My, my preacher daddy's in heaven now. If it wasn't for the things he taught me. Come on. We, we have so many people pour their lives into us. So many people help us. So many people that are blessing. God pours out his blessing. God gives us a good wife. And then something goes right and we want to start beating our chests and demanding a crown for our head. What is wrong with us? By the way, preachers, pastors, let me say this. If things are really going well at your church, you know, the next person you ought to be talking about is your people. Come on now. Way too much griping about the people we serve and the people we... Pr- you ought to look around next Sunday morning instead of sitting up there with a critical spirit. You preach against them having a critical spirit. Instead of sitting up there with a critical spirit, looking at everyone and going through the list until you find the flaws, why don't you start thanking God for the people that you have? I mean... You know, I couldn't be here tonight if I didn't have the people that I have. Me and my wife couldn't have gotten a plane and go spend two weeks in the Philippines if it wasn't for the good people of the church that said, we'll not only pay for it, but preacher, while you're gone, we're going to hold the ropes and see that everything goes right. And we're going to spend every day on our knees praying that God protects you and uses you. I can't wait to see them. You know you've been gone long enough when you start missing them. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Some of you have to be gone for a year, but I mean. <laughs> I pastor great people. Are they perfect people? No. It's a good thing because they don't have a perfect pastor. I wouldn't know what to do with perfect people. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I don't want the crown. Are you listening to me? Wherever the line is to get the crown, don't ever get in that line. That crown belongs to Jesus. Anything good happening, you get that crown on the, on the head of the one who deserves it. Come on, let's glorify the Lord. Now, preacher, it's time to close it down, then let's do that. All right? You say, preacher, but wait a minute. You mean I don't get a crown? I mean, all the stuff that... all I never get a... Wait a minute, there's going to be a day. Think about that day at the Bema Seat. Judgment seat of Christ. The Bible tells us, I won't teach her. The Bible says there's five crowns we can win. And you know, this is a crazy thing. Come on, help me. You know who's going to be giving the crowns to us that day? The only one that deserves to wear one. And I think for the first time we're going to see Jesus for all that he really is and always has been. And we're going to see ourselves for what we really are. And we're going to look at whatever achievements that we had and realize it wasn't because of us. And then knowing that, he's going to call your name and say, come on up here, Brother Ramos. And he's going to hand a crown to you. And the hands that hand the crown, you're going to see the nail scars in those hands. And I wouldn't have won anything if it wasn't for that. You know, there's a reason those four and 20 elders stand there with those crowns and look back and throw them back at the feet of Jesus and say, he alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. Sir, ma'am, if any of us deserve a crown, there'll be a day where the one who deserves all the recognition and glory will pass out the crown. But on that day, you won't even be able to keep it in your hand. You'll put it right back at his feet. We're looking for soldiers. We don't need kings. I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Scripture is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the word are my weapons of warfare. I've been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, tested by fire. I'm a volunteer in His army. And I've been listed for all eternity.
I will not get out, sell out, be talked out or pushed out. I will be faithful, reliable, capable, dependable. If God needs me, I'm there. You know why? Because I'm a soldier. I'm not a baby. I do not need to be pampered or petted or primmed up or pumped up or picked up or pepped up. You know why? I'm a soldier. No one has to call me, remind me, write me, visit me, entice me, or alert me. You know why? Because I'm a soldier. I'm not a wimp. I'm in my place. I salute my king. I obey his orders. I praise his name. I build his kingdom. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, foods, cards, or offer me candy or give me handouts. I don't need to be cuddled, cradled, cared for, or catered to. I'm committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. You know why? I'm a soldier. When Jesus called me into his army, I had nothing. Nothing. If I end up with nothing, I'll still come out ahead because I've got him. And by the way, in the end, I will win. You know why? Because he's going to win. <laughs> my God has and will continue to supply all my need. I'm more than a conqueror. I'll always triumph because of him. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. The devil cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me. And the gates of hell should fear me because I'm a soldier. Even death cannot destroy me. For when my commander calls me from his battlefield, he will promote me and then he will allow me to rule with him in that day. I'm a soldier in his army. I'm marching forward, claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. Here I stand. We need soldiers. We don't need kings.